number nine Canadian repat depot, the 100,000th repat to leave for home answers to his name. The O.C. Carlton and Yorks congratulates Corporal Knowlton, M.M., who is the man in question. He is all set to leave with his regiment and the rest of First Div on the most pleasant of all trips for a Canadian soldier, the journey back to Canada. The New Amsterdam is one of the ships which is taking a large group of the Red Patch boys on the Atlantic crossing. They go aboard complete with souvenirs from Sicily, Italy, Holland and Germany collected during the years spent abroad. Loading all through the night speeds the departure. There are no return tickets issued for this trip, and the Pipers do not play a lament as the great ship rapidly fills with happy, home-going fighting men. To hasten the whole of First Div on its way, another large liner, the Ile de France, carries another 9,000. With the experience of many ship loadings behind them, the lads stow themselves and their gear aboard in record time. Finally, the long-awaited signal heralds the departure for home shores. Memories of grim years and hearty friendships are left behind as the shores of England fade and a new life in Civvy Street beckons to the warriors of Canada's first div. Now it can be told that Canada was bombed from the skies. Many points in the Dominion and the United States were under fire from Japanese balloon bombs. Released in Japan and carried by stratospheric wind currents, already some 250 have been located and search parties are still looking for others. Inter-service bomb disposal units, immediately formed, locate and dispose of the weapons designed to threaten our great forests with incendiary fires. Many are found intact because the winter frost had stopped the mechanism which was designed to release the bombs. A clever control system kept the balloon at an even height during its nine days trip across the Pacific. If the balloon lost altitude, ballast was automatically dropped. If it rose too high, bursting was avoided by means of a robot gas release valve. Purely a nuisance weapon, the bomb was beaten by Old Man Winter and the vigilance of the inter-service bomb location squad. Canadian scientists arrive in Germany to probe into the developments and production methods employed in the large German war factories. Sent overseas by the Department of National Defense, Ottawa, each scientist is a specialist in a particular field. Canadian Army records provide them on arrival with a list of all factories and the names of German engineers who will help them to turn in a highly technical and accurate report on all phases of German manufacturing technique. One of the first plants to be visited is the damaged factory of the IG Farben industry, the largest combine in the country. Here, investigation into the chemical branch of the industry is conducted by Dr. Paul LaRose of the National Research Council, Ottawa. In the United German Metal Works, Professor Roger R. Pauvin from the Department of Metallurgy, Laval University, Quebec, looks over the shops which produced everything from nuts and bolts to the complete engine block of the Heinkel bomber. While the manager of the plant under the Nazis explains the various processes, the Canadian scientists take notes, which will be incorporated in a later full report. A 
15,000-ton press, the largest in the world, was used for pressing out airplane propellers. The results of the investigations will be forwarded to Ottawa by way of London. Here they will be available to all engineers of all companies. Hence, the Dominion's industry will profit from Canadian scientific research in Germany. The town hall at Hilversum, Holland, has been turned into a school for home planning. Men of the Canadian forces in the Netherlands, genuinely interested in building their own homes on their return to Canada, are given a six weeks course on the tricks of the trade. Conceived on the drafting board, scale models are built of the home of their choice. Building experts give them the benefit of their planning experience. The approximate cost of construction of the various types of homes is worked out. Every little detail is built to exact scale so that the whole plan can be put into operation on the return home. in some cases various modern houses of Holland as models, Johnny Canuck is all prepared to supervise the erection of his home of tomorrow. It's batter up in the sports grounds at Borden, Hampshire for the final game for the softball championships of the Canadian Army in the United Kingdom. Two CGRU go into the final tussle with a one-game lead over ten repat depot. Early in the game, they show the repats just hot and off the apple all over the lot. Despite some good hurling by the 10 repat batteries, there's no holding the RU boys when they start connecting with the old groove. Round and round they go, and where they stop, the rooters from 10 repat look mighty unhappy. The final series consists of three games. 10 repat won the first, 6 to 1. 2 CGRU took the second to the tune of 3 to 2. The team winning the series will go to the continent to play for the Canadian Army Championship. The game is over and the winning score, 2 CGRU 2, 10 Repat 0. Brigadier Sutty presents the prizes to the new softball champs of the UK, 2 CGRU. Over the Thames River course from Teddington Lock to the Kingston Rowing Club, the single sculling event in the Dominion's Victory Regatta gets underway. The pace setter in the opener is the Canadian entry, Captain Aldous, MC of Winnipeg. Thousands of spectators watch him battle it out with Sergeant Kelly of Combined British Services to cross the line, the winner. In the pairs, Lieutenant Bob Poole, MC of Ottawa, and Craftsman Ken Lagard of Vancouver win the first heat but are defeated in the final by the superior oarsmanship of the Australian pair. The big event of the day is the eights. Crews from Canada, Australia and Great Britain prepare to fight it out all the way. Under a driving continuous rain, the mighty oarsmen of three nations fight the Thames flood as they pull towards the finish line at Kingston. As the gun goes, the Australians cross the line two lengths ahead of the Canadian crew, thus winning the laurels of the Dominion Victory Regatta.